Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be back at uh, Human Data Commons. Uh, you know, it's every, what is it? This is, I think, the third time. And, uh, you know, it's an interesting group to speak to. And I'm kind of in this presentation continuing some of the themes that characterize my, my earlier ones. Uh, you know, I'm a philosopher of education, a psychologist, uh, but have an abiding impact, uh, excuse me, have an abiding interest concerning the impact of the evolution of the totalized planetary computational stack, which is what I've spoken about in my prior talks here. So the idea is that as an educator, you're concerned about human development and learning, and you look at what are the things having the largest impact on human development and learning, and you start seeing this massive planetary computational stack, um, uh, which is now, you know, attempting to almost completely capture uh, not just commodity supply chains and currency, but also the nature of uh, tension right, consciousness itself. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk about the aspects of that planetary computational stack that should actually be conceived of as what I'm calling civic infrastructure. Um, and what that means is that these are aspects of the life world, co communications infrastructure, <clears throat> which need to be able to be the condition for the possibility of governance and collective choice making. <clears throat> but, uh, the civic infrastructure that emerged with the digital was basically captured uh, and uh, now is being held hostage by algorithms. <laughs> um, and this becomes a, a deep social justice issue. It becomes an issue with the basic structures and fairness of society and the social systems that and technologies that allow for human dignity or not. So <clears throat> this is kind of like one way to summarize a little bit of what the talk's about. So uh, Martha Nussbaum, John Rawls, no doubt uh, the most important moral story. So his book, uh, you know, A Theory of Justice was, um, you know, epoch making in, uh, in moral and ethical theory, then Martha Nussbaum carried on his kind of torch and integrated with a lot of other fields to bring forward, again, one of the, one of the most robust theories of justice that are available. So there's a lot of talk of social justice, and in fact, the term social justice has become pejorative, uh, but there are very technical, philosophical definitions of justice which need to be seriously reckoned with uh, and are misunderstood by the so-called social justice warriors as much as they're misunderstood by those who castigate uh, the pursuit of justice. I mean, my first book was specifically about social justice and I worked with the strict Rawlsian definitions of justice, which I'm going to get into in this talk, these useful thought experiments to help us think about how we should structure the basic structures of society and then on the right there you have the HAL 2000 which is from the Arthur C. Clarke uh, slash Stanley Kubrick 2001 A Space Odyssey and this is kind of like one of these archetypes in our understanding of well, what do we mean by artificial intelligence and uh, the kind of eerie voice of HAL often rings in one's mind when you ask that question Artificial intelligence is in, is in quotation marks because I'm, actually, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what we mean when we say that word uh, and making a distinction between kind of general artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence and something like machine learning or algorithms. So, but before we get into it, I want, we want to position ourselves um, in uh, history. So this is a <clears throat> chart that I put together as I was studying the life of the great uh, educational philosopher, uh, John Amos Comenius, who lived in the first uh, circle, right? The, the first oval, the first time between worlds, the end of the long 16th century, the move out of mythic membership into the rational, the birth of modernity, the 
circuitous route between the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, which gave us the time period we now live in. Uh, and then I realized the parallels between that period and the period we're currently living in. So we are in the oval on the right. <laughs> uh, another time between worlds where there is both a rollover of the economic hegemon and the transformation of the deeper structures of technology and the transformation of the deeper structures of culture itself. Um, so deeply between worlds. Um, and that means we're in a context just like at the end of the 16th century, uh, like with the uh, Dutch, you know, the Dutch East India Company, where we're in a situation where very new basic structures and mechanisms for organizing social life are being created before our eyes uh, and the planetary comp computational stack is it's one of those <clears throat> and just like that period there is at this point no overarching plan for the emergence of these new forms of life technology driven uh, social structure um, uh, and so the evolution of the computational stack the evolution of the planetary stack has been makeshift ad hoc uh, mostly driven by profit um, and uh, so we saw what happened when you build massive commodity supply chains over hundreds of years <laughs> uh, with the previous hegemonic rollovers from the dutch to the british to the u.s um, when massive systems evolve in an ad hoc way they can end up creating self-terminating patterns so I put this slide up here to say we're at a kind of a choice point with the future of the digital. And that if we don't fundamentally change the way we're using digital technologies, we're gonna put ourselves in a very uh, dangerous path. Um, uh, if we do change it, then we can actually liberate a new kind of basic social structure and unprecedented actually communications infrastructure. Um, so <clears throat> it's a little bit of framing, uh, the slides will be made available to you guys as a PDF. So you'll, you'll get this figure. It's pretty useful to stare at. So a little bit more framing, um, and this will be like a summer reading list. So the stack, this book by Benjamin Bratton is what I've been mentioning. Brilliant book, thick as a phone book though. So it's something to get into. Um, this book in the center uh, by Zuloff uh, is quite remarkable. It's, it was well uh, publicized, so many people know of this book, but I really recommend taking the time to give a careful read. Uh, a lot of the themes I discussed in my last talk with you guys about the culture war and the kind of extractive mechanisms of informational capitalism that prey upon children uh, uh, through screens. Um, Zuboff runs down a much more careful analysis and uh, with a tremendous amount of historical and interview data. So it's, it's really and this machines, uh, very important to read that these three books kind of like together, or at least to think them together. Uh, and this is the one of the ways, one of the places you need to position discussion about uh, artificial intelligence, right? Um, Delanda is like a Deleuzian um, who does rigorous historical analysis of emergent properties in social systems, and in this case, in the context of warfare and the use of computers. Uh, in particular, cybernetics uh, uh, to remake warfare. So here's some more books. <clears throat> so Baudrillard, Simulacra Simulation, extremely important book uh, for understanding uh, kind of just how deep the, uh, the subjective complexity is of living in a postmodern culture. Um, Baudrillard's work is pivotal there. Uh, the New Dark Age I mentioned in my last talk with you all, um, this is a kind of a frightening book, which looks very specifically at some of the stuff I'm really speaking to today, which Zuboff also speaks to uh, in her surveillance capitalism, which is just how insidious the nature of 
totalized surveillance and behavioral surplus capture, which is to say your screen is watching you <laughs> and uh, watching your every move. Uh, and so uh, we'll get into some of those themes. And then this news bomb book is a good place to, to go for a very up-to-date um, and rigorous conception of Rawlsian perspective on social justice factoring things that emerged post Rawls, which is to say factoring uh, postmodernism, um, uh, post-colonial discourse. Uh, so Piketty's follow-up to um, capital in the 21st century, capital and ideology, um, also will be uh, discussed today um, in terms of the philosophical and academic uh, justifications for regimes of inequality um, that all societies are structured unequally but as inequalities reach points of extreme which we are in one uh, then what you get are complex and ornate uh, ideological constructions uh, which end up kind of justifying the nature of the of the inequality regime so you know i'm a developmental psychologist so mo many the way that these affect individual development. So one of my touchstones here has been Michael Tomasello for a while, and this is his new book on human development. Fascinating stuff. The key there being the uh, importance of joint attention, which is to say the importance of being with other humans in real time, sharing consciousness and attention, uh, and suffusing that with language and gesture and ritual. Um, that there are basic aspects that have been part and parcel of human socialization since there have been humans, which are starting to be captured by the computational stack. So we'll get into that. And then this final book, Facing Apocalypse, um, a remarkable book. It's got essays by James Hillman, Joanna Macy, um, uh, and it just looks at historically the dynamics of ideation and psychology around the end of the world. Um, and again, if you go back to the figure, you know, there were, have always been these times when it seemed like the world basically was ending and in one sense it was. Uh, and we're in one of those times when the nature of what social systems will look like 50 to 100 years from now is so fundamentally different that the impending sense that we're kind of like between worlds, which means we're also at the end of one type of world is true. So then you get these archetypal projections of apocalyptic reasoning and visioning. Um, so it's important to note that in the realm of artificial intelligence in particular, um, you find, especially among the kind of techno optimist transhumanists, you find a kind of uh, a kind of eschatology or a kind of way, a kind of uh, religious thinking, let's put it that way. And it's because they're tapping into these archetypal uh, modes of the psyche concerning apocalyptic uh, things, which this book touches on. So it's worth throwing in there. All right. So that's, that's kind of all my citations. And now I'm just going to talk like from the hip basically. So, all right. So, Artificial intelligence. Uh, what do we really mean when we say this word? And I'm not an expert in artificial intelligence, but I've been tracking the discourse since the 80s, um, on and off, first in science fiction, and then as in the cognitive science department, and then kind of debating with people at MIT when I was in graduate school about what learning means. Um, but I noticed that the debate shifted over time, uh, and it shifted away from these really deep questions about could computer hardware create consciousness and autonomous choice? Uh, and it shifted to could algorithms predict or mimic human behavior? Uh, and that's more classically, more technically, more like a machine learning problem than it is like quote unquote artificial intelligence, let alone artificial general intelligence. So this is a little bit semantics, but I want to note that 
most of the time when the word artificial intelligence is is used, uh, it's it's meant in to talk about these kinds of algorithms. So like when we are looking at uh, Watson, right? Uh, the famous, um, uh, who is it? Is it GE? I forget who makes Watson now or IBM. I think it's IBM. You know, Watson is an example of this. The algorithmic curation of Facebook feeds, the uh, <clears throat> artificially intelligence analyzed big data sets, all of those machinations, which are unprecedented in computer science. Like, I'm not saying they're not amazing. But I am saying uh, that it's about complex causality and the actuation of algorithmic causality through massive amounts of data with attention to predictive validity and things of that nature. But it's not about the replication of conscious choice or the creation of a new form of sentient intelligence, right? So this is your classic artificial intelligence. Um, I don't know if you guys remember the movie Short Circuit, the guy down there at the bottom, Five Alive. Um, but the other ones are more, more recognizable. But that's not what we're talking about <laughs> when we're talking about artificial intelligence uh, anymore. That used to be, it seems to me. Maybe I'm just out of touch. But uh, when I hear it talked about in the news and when I hear it talked about uh, in discourse with technologists and people who are developing apps and people who talk about the election and things of that nature, uh, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about artificial intelligence or other things taking place within the internet uh, and, and also uh, the internet of things in particular, which is to say that the entirety of the planetary computational stack is suffused with algorithms that are basically artificial intelligence uh, according to contemporary nomenclature. Uh, so, and the bots, right? Something like uh, in the James Bridell book in uh, The New Dark Age, he has a citation where he says something like 25 to 30% of the discourse on Facebook leading up to the 2016 election was with bots, right? So that's interesting, right? Uh, that what you have are algorithms so complex uh, that they can communicate with you through an asynchronous text-based medium like Facebook. And uh, they can get you riled up and into an argument the last 45 minutes. <laughs> or they can be used like this one and other ones. Uh, and there are some that focus on psychological well-being or dating or other things where you're holding a conversation with a bot and you know you are. Um, there are bots that keep old people company. Um, uh, now, again, these are nothing like HAL 2000 or like the forms of conscious intelligence choice artificial intelligence used to be about and probably still is in certain domains. Um, but this is, a, this is beginning to characterize the uh, entirety of the computational stack and the social media feeds in particular. Um, uh, kind of double clicking on this notion of uh, a, basically AI assisted or algorithmically assisted micro-targeting of political advertisements. So the idea here is that the new civic infrastructure, especially things like social media, things like uh, the news, um, you know, journalism, uh, and a couple other odds and ends, uh, that there's been basically a, a capture of the cultural and educational means of production. You know, you'll remember in the early days of the internet, or some of you, uh, the sense of like utopian almost fervor about what a completely interconnected and open communications infrastructure would bring to humanity on a planetary scale. Um, and so this has not uh, come to pass. And it, it's not that the means of production haven't changed. It's not that there isn't a universal or nearly universal uh, planetary computational communication structure that wasn't there, let's say, 10 years ago. There is. And people are communicating in completely unprecedented ways. But the medium through which they are communicating has been fundamentally uh, 
captured and therefore is being disrupted by quote unquote AI driven surveillance and extraction. So that's one part of the mechanism, which is that they have and then doing rich semantic analysis of your actual statements, queries, and things of that nature. This was well documented by people like Zubal. Uh, and then related to that, the artificial and quote unquote intelligence driven behavior manipulation, uh, that the goal of the micro-targeted Facebook advertising and the goal of the curation, the algorithmically curation, uh, algorithmically curated news feeds. Uh, the goal of these things is to affect behavior. Um, and again, Facebook, uh, this was I think 2016 or 17 when they published in Nature, uh, the Facebook researchers, the massive experiment that they had done uh, in behavior manipulation, uh, affecting people's moods by algorithmically curating their news feeds. Um, so, but that's just, you know, what they're willing to show us, what you have to understand is that the, the whole system uh, is set up there. The, the second bullet, the planetary computational stack is becoming a massive behavioral measurement and modification system mm -hmm. that if you go beyond even the screens and you look at the cameras and you look at the sensor networks that constitute the measurement metastructure within the planetary computational stack, and then you realize that many of the sensors in the internet of things can also be actuators. So like uh, your thermostat, right? I forget what it's called, Nest or something. It's a product I think maybe Amazon owns now, but it's a th smart quote unquote thermostat. Uh, it's actually got a speaker uh, and a mic and a camera uh, and senses everything within 10 feet of it. <laughs> Uh, and it can also turn off and on your heat and do other things in your house. And so that's a general pattern that many sensors are also actuators. Your screen in your hand on your, with your phone, your, your smartphone is a, both a sensor, sensor and an actuator. If you believe that the micro-targeted advertising can actually get you to do things, then your screen just became an actuator, make you do things. Um, so what you have is this planetary computational stack morphing into something that can measure human behavior on a massive scale, build models of probability, and then work to actually affect behavior. Um, and this is me basically restating Zuboff with uh, Benjamin Bratton's notion of the stack, kind of like making the notion more ubiquitous and complex. And then you end up seeing that this thing that I just described, which is unprecedented, is sitting on top of the communications infrastructure, transportation, and commodity exchange infrastructures that constitute the kind of quote, internet of things, right? So yes, that's all there. And then on top of it, there's the measurement metastructure and actuator network, um, which uh, you know is not being built as such. Like it's being built to make a bunch of money. <laughs> uh, it's not being built as a, as a basic human infrastructure that's gonna affect all of the communication and interaction that we have. And that's what it is. So the idea that the, the way the digital has been conceived and rolled out for the most part uh, has, has been uh, ineffective or lacking the full potential of what the digital might be as a civic infrastructure. So this one way ticket here from the digital technology influencing the individual, which then gets them to do something. Uh, and this is, you know, largely the way that the kind of screen-based interaction is understood. Um, uh, now there are exceptions to this, uh, of course, uh, but I always just want to point out of this being a pervasive way of thinking about kind of like, uh, how digital technology is used in the kind of matrix of influencing uh, human behavior. Um, so I'm gonna be returning to this figure, but it's important to, to just keep this in mind as a certain, as a certain pattern. Uh, so, so now we're getting to like the deeper argument. So all of that's laid out, right? Uh, the basic 
thing I'm saying is that what this means is that the digital media landscapes and a great deal of the communications infrastructure that are now in the hands of the algorithms and the advertisers, that this stuff is, is these are actually basic structures. And that's a technical term from sociology and from ethics. Um, basic structures are those parts of society that you can judge in terms of justice and efficiency. Because now I'm going to get in a little bit to the, what it means to work in terms of a formal philosophical theory of justice. But the idea is that, um, you know, not everything is about justice, you know, like uh, people who are mean to one another on the street, rude people, that's not an issue of justice. Um, whether someone decides to meditate all day and emaciate themselves and attain higher states of consciousness, or if they decide to uh, live a conventional life in the suburbs or those kinds of uh, kind of virtue ethics, who do you want to be? Those aren't issues of justice. Justice is a, it's a very specific thing and it has to do with the way the society as a whole and the institutions within that society kind of like shape the society in terms of its harmony. That's where the word comes from. So are the basic structures of the society fair or not? Right. This is this is the way to think about it. And an example of a basic structure would be like the tax code. And so this is Piketty's point in the capital of the 21st century, uh, that the tax code shifted fundamentally after 1970 into a situation that allowed the rich to get a lot richer way quicker and made the poor poorer. Right. So that's a basic structure. Other other legal infrastructures are basic structures. Uh, the educational system is a basic structure. In my first book, I argue that actually standardized tests end up being basic structures because they're kind of immovable objects within the society, like the SAT, although that's, a, that's debatable now that no one's taking it, uh, but that's a separate conversation. So the basic structures are these immovable kind of like patterns within the society uh, which distribute reward, right? They distribute resources. They they shape the nature of our cooperation and divvy up the kind of shared fruits of our cooperation. And so the argument I'm making here is that, you know, digital infrastructure, digital media landscapes in particular, which is to say the informational ecology is not entertainment. It's not like a accoutrement or an accessory to the basic structures of society, right? Um, it's, it's different than television. Uh, it's different uh, than even books, although books ended up creating, back to my friend John Amos Comenius, books ended up creating the printing press in particular, ended up creating the school systems that we know. They realize, oh, geez, books are everywhere. We need to get this stuff distributed in a particular way. Uh, so the point is that, yeah, we've reached another critical threshold of technology development where we have to actually understand a new emergent phenomenon as a basic structure of society and then begin to treat it this way. Um, uh, yeah. So back to John Rawls. So John Rawls came up with this brilliant thought experiment, uh, which basically uh, um, is about the, the kind of the way the mind and human reason uh, thinks about justice. So basically he, he kind of uh, came up with the notion of what's come to be called the original position. Um, and what it is is it is a thought experiment to scaffold the reader, or I'm going to do it here with you guys, to scaffold our thinking about justice and fairness, which is to say, all right, we, we want to institute a new law, or we want to change the tax code, or we want to think about uh, the extent to which the existing digital technology landscape is fair or not, right? Uh, not is it profitable and efficient, right? Not is it distracting and interesting, but does it create a social situation that is fundamentally fair or just for those people who have no choice but to engage in it? 
So the original position goes like this. Uh, you basically imagine yourself in something like a constitutional convention, right? You're with a bunch of people and you're discussing about, you know, should this thing be instituted, right? Um, should we build this thing Facebook, right? Facebook, which extracts a bunch of behavioral data and then kind of manipulates your news feed as they see fit based on certain things that you're not even privy to often. Uh, should that thing be built? Right? It's kind of a biased choice. <laughs> Uh, so you're sitting there, you're talking, and the basic thought is like is instant. I'm put myself in every possible position that could result, and see if I would be willing to consent to this thing, not knowing who I would be on the other side of its implementation. Right. So you abstract completely from your current position in society. And you think, all right, let's take the SAT. This is one I know well. The SAT, right? That's a certain basic structure that distributes access of educational resources. Could I consent to the SAT as it's instituted, not knowing who I would be? Which is to say, if I'm a super smart, good test taker with enough money to get test prep courses, then of course I'd be happy getting the SAT instituted as it is. If I'm a uh, poor learning disabled student with test anxiety, then obviously I wouldn't, right? So you have to think about all the positions of all the people who could be affected. So this is like a very complex social moral perspective taking ask. Uh, and then you end up uh, thinking who, who might you be? And are there positions within the social structure that's emerging? Are there positions that you wouldn't want to actually be in? Like, so for example, in this diagram here, like who might you be? Who might you end up as if you don't know who you'll be, <laughs> right? The thought experiment is that open. It's like, I don't know. I could end up being one of the owners of digital technology, right? I could end up being an elected official or a corporate executive, or I could end up being one of these so-called users, right? So this question of, the regime of inequality that's implemented here in the realm of the digital ends up from the position of the original position uh, revealing that there are deep asymmetries of learning and power. Like one of the reasons you wouldn't want to be a user in this model is because well, the user is being used, right? And the dynamic is one in which the benefits accrue to almost everyone except the user um, and the knowledge of what is happening which is to say the asymmetric learning that's taking place the owners and runners of the digital technologies are learning about you uh, at a much and learning about people in general at a much rapider rate <laughs> using tools that we don't have access to and zuboff points this out that there's not just economic inequalities that there's a new inequalities of learning and asymmetric power. So that gets revealed when you start to be like in the abstract, whoa, wait a second, what are the different positions within this emerging basic structure? And can all of the positions be consented to? Uh, and then you also notice that the threat of uh, basically something like paternalism replacing uh, legitimate teacherly authority emerges. Um, so you know, the surveil and influence uh, dynamic that takes place between the social media and the social media user, uh, where the algorithmic curation of the news feed ends up being a hidden curriculum, right? That the net effect of algorithmic curation is a sequence of experiences which results in a transformation of person which is to say that it's teaching you <laughs> for better and for worse. And the algorithm is subverting or supplanting traditional teacherly authority that you learn a conspiracy theory via YouTube by watching five YouTube videos in a sequence. The sequence was provided for you by YouTube, right? So it's 
Unidynamics of Future with Authority. Struct until you start to look at it from the original position. And then the other important thing to remember with the Rawlsian thought experiment of, okay, think in the abstract, what would it look like if this was instituted? Could I consent to this if I don't know who I would be in the social structure that results? You have to mind the position of the least well off, right? Those who are in the social dynamic, who are the least well positioned to be able to uh, kind of like, you know, weather the institutional storms. And so that means when you're thinking about uh, social media and digital technology landscapes, you need to think about those people who participate in them who are the least advantaged as far as they're being able to grapple with them, right? So you, many, you hear many people defending Facebook and social media because they themselves have found an extremely sophisticated, reflective manner of dealing with the digital media environment. Uh, usually the result of a lot of education and other learning that's taken place that allows them to, you know, basically get the best out of Facebook without getting completely uh, overwhelmed uh, and uh, confused by it. But that's rare, right? Who, think about the non-reflective adolescent, right, who's hopelessly addicted to Instagram or Facebook, who has none of the reflective capacity, right? That's an example, children in particular. Uh, are an example of those who are often in the position of the least well off. And so you judge the fairness of a system or you judge the justice of a system from the position of the least well off, not from, not from the position of the most well off. So again, you know, obviously the users are the least well off here, but then if you think deeper into the category of users about who would be the least well off among the users, you end up seeing that there's what Alexander Bard called something like a digital underclass of a consumerate, um, which is to say a uh, you know kind of newly emergent social category of people who are almost totally surveilled and then uh, deeply. Um, so that's the basic question. Can we consent to the thing in the original position? Can we consent to the basic digital infrastructure that we have to use right now? Can we consent to that from the original position? Um, so what am I suggesting? I mean, obviously I'm saying no, <laughs> no, we can't. <laughs> I'm saying the thing as it's set up right now uh, is broken uh, and unjust. Um, and that's when you get up into the bowels of it. I mean, I, you know, there's, a, there's even more to say about, you know, the digital divide that exists between the global north and the global south and other aspects of just looking at the digital uh, uh, from a social justice perspective. What I've been focusing on specifically is the algorithmically digital uh, and, and whether those systems like the social media platforms and the video distribution platforms and the mainstream media news websites that surveil you, um, and then the internet of things and the sensor networks, um, which are also part of this larger behavioral surplus extraction and prediction uh, profit center that Zuboff describes. Uh, I'm saying no, this is, we can't consent to this because if you're in the position of the least well off, um, it's quite bad. Um, so I'm suggesting that we actually and are in a critical moment to renew the civic infrastructure that the digital might be. Um, and so this is a call to institutionalize the digital as a basic structure and to understand the significance of that. Um, and this doesn't necessarily mean like nationalizing the basic components of the internet. I'm not sure that that's the way to go. Um, but I do think if you put the digital and the design of digital technologies and access to them, you begin to put it in a class uh, of um, ethically non-commodifiable entities. Um, 
Uh, so that's just worth noting like water and air <laughs> and transportation and education uh, and a f you know, uh, courts of law, um, rule of law, constitutions, <laughs> things that uh, need to be removed from the simple dynamics of the market and made part of a viable, sustainable life world for the society to function. Uh, so yeah, so that's one thing. Institutionalize the digital as a basic structure. Um, this would change the incentives fundamentally behind tech innovation, because if we were to recharacterize the fundamental goal of innovating technology as having to do with aiding human development, deepening human consciousness, enriching human education and relationship, <laughs> uh, then we would see what the potential of the digital actually is. Um, right now, the incentives behind tech innovation are to make money and uh, return, uh, get return to investors and then eventually to shareholders. Um, and it sounds quite crude and simplistic and I wish it wasn't, <laughs> uh, but when you get right down to it, um, this has been the way the industry was built. Uh, and then the deeper call here is to consciously evolve the planetary computational stack, which is to say right now it's evolving in an ad hoc way uh, with in the sense that it's actually an structure, but so basically yeah, as a totality and begin to imagine a different future for the planetary computational stack itself. Uh, which right now is in closing in on us, encircling us in behavioral surveillance and uh, behavioral manipulation, uh, artificial intelligence. <laughs> so we need to roll that back and start thinking about what the proper use of these incredibly powerful tools uh, might be, a use that would be resonant with uh, the nature of justice itself. Um, a little kind of like back of a napkin sketch uh, shows a different possibility of nonlinear relationships um, and cooperative dynamics where digital technologies enable collective inquiry, which justify and enact collective choice. The outcomes of those choices benefit individuals who then build and utilize digital technologies in an around the loop. This is not well thought out. <laughs> and, uh, and neither is the first figure, which was simply linear. Um, but I want to point that the possibility for digital technologies to bring us together in collective inquiry beyond our screens is one of the most potent things that's possible, right? We've confused the internet with what happens on our screens because the stuff on the internet's been built to keep us staring at our screens. Like that's how they evaluate the success <laughs> of their applications usually is the amount of time you spend staring at the thing, uh, which then they turn your staring and clicking into monetizable uh, behavioral information for advertisers. Uh, but if it wasn't the goal of the technologies to keep you transfixed at the screen, but rather to have the minimal amount of screen time necessary to then go find somebody that needs to be embodied, and then that there's a possibility that the dis that the that the technology and the screen in particular uh, can disappear into the flow of the life world, uh, and that the technology can disappear disappear into the flow of rich in-person communication and scaffold higher level collective choice enriching individual development um, without the screen being like a, a data extraction and sensor uh, pusher. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's a little bit of where I would go with this and where I go in my thinking about uh, educational technologies where I make the same point. 
that uh, it's not an educational technology if you're just staring at a screen all day. <laughs> Uh, that there's a lot more that can be done with the nature of the digital than uh, using screens to capture attention. Um, so more uh, things I'd like to see. <laughs> uh, save the informational and educational commons. Right? This, is the, this is the moment, right? It's the final frontier of the commodification of the life world, getting right down into our most in intimate moments. Uh, that are all being captured and run through artificial intelligence semantic analysis to see where vulnerabilities are to try to sell us advertisements. Sounds like I'm making it up, but read the zoo ball. <laughs> the TV in your living room, depending on when it was made and who it was made by, uh, could be recording all of your conversations, sending those to places to be uh, analyzed, etc. cetera. Uh, so we need to roll back the commodification and of the informational and educational commons, uh, and then preserve the right to sanctuary and to a future tense. This is Zuboff's language. So most people with that TV wouldn't know that the TV is surveilling them. They think they're in the sanctuary of their home, but they're actually still being used as a point of extraction by advertising companies. Uh, so we need to find a way to preserve the right to sanctuary from the digital. Uh, and then because of the intensity of the surveillance and the way that's being rolled out into behavior manipulation, this notion of preserving the right and help uh, at the level of um, micro-targeted uh, behavior manipulation. Um, uh, and then finally, yeah, the, the reworking of the digital could create truly new conditions, as I've been trying to allude to. This isn't an anti-digital thing or an anti-internet thing. This is saying we haven't even seen what the potentials are because it was early captured. Uh, so I'm saying that, yes, we could find a way to reconfigure these basic civic infrastructures, the new ones provided by the digital. Uh, for like unprecedented richness of collective sense making and collective choice. So that's it. That's the talk. Um, you know, my general sense is that mostly it's what I've said is diagnostic, and uh, there isn't a strong sense of kind of like concrete next steps that I have. Um, but it's a diagnostic and a little bit of a, like a, almost like a prophetic warning about the directionality of the current computational stack, uh, which is echoing what I've said uh, to this group um, for some time. So uh, I'll stop sharing and then we can go into uh, questions.